Hi everyone. So today we'll continue with uh, the rest of the chapter on loops and methods in Java. Before we start, I want to tell you about uh, the sample midterm, which I uploaded in assignments. If you scroll down after homework one, you will find the sample meter. It requires the responders log and browser to take. It's a sample meter, so it's actually easy for you to just test if uh, you have all the requirements for taking the exam. You have 80 minutes to complete this exam. It's a closed book exam. You're not allowed to use the textbook, uh, lecture notes. This, these are the same instructions that will appear in the real meter one. Uh, I also posted a post about midterm one logistics. So the exam will appear at the time of the exam, which is exactly one week from today. You must look, uh, use lockdown browser and that's why you should download it as soon as possible and try it on the sample midterm. During the exam, I will be available for my office uh, on my office hours Google Meet in case that you encounter problems. And I will basically take a look at uh, uh, your screen and what's happening. Uh, the way that I set up the midterm is that it's you can take it a single time, but in case that you have to leave for any kind of uh, uh, reasons like the browser crashes or uh, the internet or the electricity goes away, you can just come back and continue the same exam. Uh, we will grade the exam on the same day with the exam and announce the availability of the results on Piazza. And you can actually use, again, the lockdown browser, browser by clicking on the grade to actually see your exam and compare your uh, results with the expected results and the uh, uh, correct solution. So first thing that you should probably do is to download the lockdown browser from the Stony Brook uh, website. You can directly go to the soft web and use your net ID and password to log in and download and install this uh, browser. It's called Respondus Lockdown Browser. It's like uh, Mozilla Firefox or Chrome or Edge or Safari. It's a browser. It only allows you to open a single uh, tab and to basically give the exam uh, in, in Blackboard. You open Blackboard and then you go directly to the exam. You cannot navigate away. You can't open notes or anything. It's basically just the exam. So you're not distracted by anything. You take the exam for the duration of the exam and then uh, you save your results and you will grade them. A sample test is available on Blackboard in assignments. I showed you is this sample midterm one. And you can basically take this test uh, by Wednesday just to make sure that you can take exams with the lockdown browser. And in case that something doesn't go right, come to my office hours and we'll see what's uh, the solution for you. I also included the sample test in the Word document and with and without solutions. So that's all about the, the midterm and logistics which are posted on uh, Black on Piazza and the sample that is posted on Blackboard. So let's start with loops and continue the lecture from last time. So last time we talked about while loops. Their syntax is very similar to the syntax of if statements. Uh, the only difference is that is actually a loop and it executes while the condition is true. The moment that the condition becomes false, you exit the loop and continue with the rest of the statements after the loop. Do while loops are a little bit different in the fact that the continuation condition is tested after we execute the bo body of the loop. So really the statements are executed at least once. Basically no condition is tested before the ex execution of the statements. And then the loop continuation condition is uh, evaluated if it's true, we continue back to reevaluate the loop body and then again the condition and so on. If the, con the moment that the condition becomes false, it exits the loop when that while statement is executed. Okay. So that's a do while loop. Usually, do while loops are used for a menu program, something that you must execute at least once, like read an option that the user enters, like A, B, C, depending on what uh, conversion, let's say, you want to make, like in the homework one. 
So you print the menu and you uh, take the input in the do while loop. And here is an example. I created a scanner before the while loop, uh, de declared selection, a string. I incremented the counter. I started with uh, defining a counter equal with zero. And then I'm asking the user to enter an option. So we print out choose a menu option, P for print counter and Q for quit and we read uh, the input from the user. So the user enters a selection, a string. Uh, if the string in uppercase equals with uppercase P, then we print the value of the counter and we increment the counter with one. In, a while, in the do while statement, the condition is that is not the case that the selection in uppercase is equal with Q. So as long as the user doesn't enter Q, this executes in that loop and it basically reads the inputs from the user. The user can enter other letters, they are going to be ignored. The only two letters that have any effect is P for printing and incrementing the counter and Q for exiting the loop. The moment that the user does enter Q, then the selection is equal with Q. Therefore, the negation of the selection is false and we exit the while loop and we print goodbye. So these kind of print statements are common to be print, to be uh, executed with do while loops. I see there are some questions in the chat. So our class starts at 6.05. The midterm will be posted on March 8 at 6.05. It will be available for 80 minutes. So after 7.25, the midterm will disappear from uh, Blackboard. You have exactly 80 minutes from the moment that you started the exam to finish the exam and submit it. Okay. So here, here is a sample execution. So for instance, we print out all that output choosing the menu option P or Q. If the user enters P, then we print the value of the counter zero. We increment the counter to one, it's a post increment. And then since the condition is false, the letter entered is not Q, it will try again. So again, it prints out the menu. Let's say that the user enters A, it will be ignored. It prints out the menu, the user enters P and the counter is printed one and incremented to two. And this repeats until the user enters Q and we exit the program. So this is the way that do while statements execute. The most common type of loops are for loops. So for loops have four parts. For, and then we have an initial action within the parentheses, semicolon in the same parentheses of a block, uh, the loop continuation condition, semicolon, and the action after each iteration. The initial action is a statement. So is the action after each iteration. The loop continuation condition is a Boolean expression. Then we have the loop body uh, after we finish the block. And again, here the block within the for statement is optional. If you have a single statement, you can put it without a block. If you want more than one statement, you should start with curly brace and put a block. So again, what's happening? First, the initial action is executed. Usually that is an initialization or we declare a variable i and we assign it with some value, zero, let's say. Then it executes the loop continuation condition. So that condition could be false or true. If it's true, then we continue executing the loop body, the statements in the loop body. And then we continue to the action after each iteration and execute that one. That's usually an increment or a decrement. Then we continue and come back to check the loop continuation condition. So it's basically in this for loop, it actually has stuff that usually we have in a while loop. So we have the initial action, something that is set before the while loop. The loop continuation condition is about the same. The action after each iteration is like a statement that is put at the end of the loop body in a while statement. So let me show you an example. For instance, we want to print 100 times, welcome to Java. 
we declare a variable i, we initialize in the initial action i equal with zero. Zero is less than 100 is true. So it prints once welcome to Java. Then it executes the action after each iteration. It increments i with one and checks again the condition. Is one less than 100? Yes. Prints out welcome to Java, increments i to two. And this executes in a loop until i becomes 100 and the condition becomes false. In that moment, we exit the loop. So a for statement has four parts, the initial action, the loop continuation condition, the action after each iteration, and the body of the loop. Now, if loops are extremely popular for counting, through the indices in a string, remember that a string has characters. And we can iterate with an index from 0 to the length of the string minus 1 and collect every character, print every character of the string. Later, we will see that we can iterate through the indices in an array, a data structure that we'll learn. Or we can uh, iterate through an algorithm. For instance, let's say that we want to print the characters in a string in reverse order. So that's a, we need an algorithm, a loop, that iterates from the end of the string to the beginning and collect the characters one by one. So loops are good for algorithms that require a known number of iterations. For instance, we know that the string has a length of 15, and we know exactly that we want to iterate from 0 to 14, the indices in the array. Those are called the controlled, counter-controlled loops. So before we continue, let me show you an example. So let's assume that we want to iterate through the characters of a string. So this is, we ask the user to input the string and we are going to use next line to read the string. Let's define a string variable. And our goal in this example is to print the characters of the string one per line. So we write a loop for every integer i starting from zero, the first index in the string as long as i is less than the length of the string, and we had the length of a string using the length method, we increment i after each iteration, and we have a system out println s dot character at index i in that string. Okay. So this is it. Basically, it's a loop that the initial action is i is in it's assigned zero. The condition is that i is less than the length of the string. i is incremented with one after each iteration. And the loop body, because it contains a single statement, doesn't have to be put within curly braces. Well, basically, we can, but we don't have to. So we basically just print every character with print ln. So we basically have a new line. So now let's say that we enter a string. So for instance, Paul, and it will print P, A, U, and L, one per line. Okay, so this is an example. For instance, now let's say that we want to print the characters in reverse order. So we can modify this for loop a little bit. Instead of iterating from zero to the length, let's iterate from the length as dot length minus one, the previous to the last uh, to the length, as long as i is greater than equal with zero, the action after each iteration is to subtract one. And we basically run the same problem. So again, let's say that we enter Paul. And now you see, it starts with the character at index, the length minus one, which is the last character in the string. L, then it, it, it decrements I with one and it goes in opposite order, U, A, P. Okay. So now we just wrote an algorithm, an algorithm that iterates from the end of the string to the beginning. The action is decrementing. So basically we start with this is uh, three. The next character will be the character at index two. Then we decrement again, the character at index one and then the character at index zero. When the i becomes i minus one, this condition minus one greater than zero is false, and we finish the program.
Okay. So now I can see a question. Can you make it for integer i from zero, uh, i less than the length, the system out print ln, the character at plus two? Okay, that's a very good so, uh, option. So I will take this statement out from here and I will put it here, decrementing i after each iteration. And there is no statement, basically semicolon is the nothing to execute in the body of the loop. So again, all, and it executes exactly the same. Yeah. So I agree with Greg, never do that. And the reason why, so this is any statement. As I said, the three parts are these two initial action and action after each iteration are statements and they can be print statements, but not, not a problem. So let's see how it works. So let's say that we want this for loop to print twice, welcome to Java. So we declare i, we assign zero to i, zero less than two is true. We print out welcome to Java once and we execute the action after each iteration. We increment i to one, from zero to one. One less than two is still true. So we print out again, welcome to Java. We increment i, from one to two, two less than two is false, and we finish the program. So the initial action in the for loop can be a list of zero or more comma separated expressions. So basically, if you want, you can declare multiple variables. You can declare i equals zero, comma j equals zero, and so on. The action after each iteration in the for loop can also be a list of zero or more comma separated statements. So if I have both i and j and I want to increment them both, I can separate them with comma i plus plus comma j plus plus. Now, I don't have to have a block. I can put semicolon like basically no operation statement as being the loop body. So the loop body can actually be empty as long as you basically have this semicolon here to state that this is followed by the empty statement. There is nothing in the loop body. In fact, I would say that it's even a better style to just leave it like this. If you have to do such a thing. Again, I agree with Greg that this is a little bit not quite uh, okay to have statements within the action after each iteration. It's easy. It's it's easier to make mistakes and that's not something that we want to do. If the loop continuation condition in a for loop is omitted, it's assumed to be implicitly true. So you can leave, for instance, empty, both the initial action, the loop continuation condition is by default true then, and the action after each iteration is empty too. So basically this is like an infinite loop. It's equivalent with stating while true do something. So this is an infinite loop. It's quite useful sometimes. It basically it's useful to declare servers that are supposed to be always on and for every request to basically either spawn a different process to take care of that request or to respond to the request. So servers usually work this way. They have a while through and they run forever waiting for basically uh, clients to connect to it. Again, caution with adding the semicolon at the end of the for clause before the loop body, because if you do put it, so for instance, you use the beginning of uh, line open block, then if you actually put a semicolon here, this is like the empty statement. So this loop, for instance, doesn't do anything. It basically just iterates from zero to 10 by incrementing i at every step and finishes without doing anything. This is the no operation itself. So in this case, actually, it will be a compiler error because I was actually could be a compiler error, although I is actually initialized because it's already initialized in the uh, action after each iteration. So the output is just different than we expected. We probably expected I to be printed from uh, zero to uh, nine but we are actually just getting i equal with 10 because that's the moment that this condition becomes false and we reach this print statement. It's usually a logical error, 
uh, sometimes when you actually define the integer i inside here, i is unknown outside because again, variables that are defined within the for loops, uh, for loop initial action, dis disappear after the for loop ends. Any questions? And we have the same case, but even worse in the case of while loops. Because if you do put a semicolon here, you've got an infinite loop. What's basically happening is that while i is less than 10, execute nothing, will basically test this condition forever. And of course, since i is never modified, uh, this condition is always true, zero less than 10 true, zero less than 10 true and so on. So it goes forever. In either case is a logical error. It's an error that you should correct either by printing the correct output, like in the example of this for loop or modifying this, taking out the semicolon. So you actually have a, a loop that terminates and prints the result that you expected. But it's, this is a common mistake. While, do while and for loops are expressively equivalent meaning that you basically can express the same kind of problems. Now, the truth is that expressivity is actually defined maybe in a very lax way. It's not defined as, uh, it's defined as complexity. How complex of problems can you express? But sometimes you also have to think about easiness of uh, expressing a program. So, it's true that all of these kind of loops are equivalent. A while loop can be transformed into a uh, for loop by just leaving empty the initial action and the action after the each iteration, because that is usually included in the loop body. Similarly, if you have a for loop, that can be transformed into a while loop. You basically execute the action after uh, initial action before the while loop, then you have a while loop that has the loop continuation condition, the loop body, and the action after each iteration is within the body of that while loop. So any loop, for loop can be expressed as a while loop, a while loop as a for loop, and equivalent to, to do while loops. Do while loops can be expressed in while loops and for loops and vice versa. Now, it's true that it's not probably the right way to do it. Uh, again, expressivity, it doesn't mean only complexity class, but it also means uh, ease of expressing a problem. So you will actually start gaining, uh, as you practice, uh, experience of when to use while loops, when to use for loops, when to use do while loops, based on what do you do. If you have a counting loop, you should use a for loop. If you know the range that you need to count with some variable over, you will use a for loop. If you want to print a menu, that's one case in which you will use a do while loop. And most cases when you actually do not know the range, but you know a logical condition that needs to be uh, true while they exec executing the loop. And when it becomes false, it stops the loop, you would use a while loop. So it's an ease of uh, programming problem. So let's see a bunch of examples. So one thing to be careful about when you transform from one kind of loop to another is to not increment variables multiple times. So if you probably wrote a while loop and then you decided I'm going to transform this to a for loop, you may have this case in which you increment your counting variable twice, once at the end of the for loop and once in the action after each iteration. So be careful not to do that. Sometimes you may actually want to define a flag for a complex condition. So let's assume that you have some very complex condition. And in that case, in order to execute the while loop, you don't want to execute the complex condition within the while statement condition itself. You can start by assigning the uh, condition a, va a true value, like more work flag is equal to true. While more, more work flag is true, basically execute the body. And internally, you can either assign a logical expression to more work flag, 
or use if statements to define the more work flag. So these kind of flags or Boolean flags are loop conditions that are usually in, uh, assigned values inside the loop, testing for the end condition. When that condition is reached, uh, the flag is turned off, turned false. And once it's turned false, the loop ends. Sometimes it also uses break statements. So in order to skip the rest of the uh, loop, you would break like we did in the case of a uh, uh, switch case statement. Feel free at any moment to stop me to ask questions. The next kind of loop is loops in which we want to compute a sum, a sequence, the sum of a sequence of elements. So for instance, we want to compute the sum of all the integers from one to four. You can compute the sum from one to any number n. You initialize the sum with zero before you enter the for loop. Uh, for a for loop, as long as uh, we define an integer in the initial action, i equal with one, as long as i is less than four, uh, the sum is incremented with the value of i, and i is incremented with one after each iteration. So here we can actually see an example. How do we actually compute the sum from of the numbers from one to four? So first, the sum is zero i is assigned one, then the sum is incremented with i, which is one, i is incremented to two, two is still less than four. So now the sum is incremented to, with two, which one plus two is three. Uh, i is incremented to three, three is less than four is still true. So now the value of the sum is three plus three is six, the old sum plus i and the sum assigned back to the sum. Then i is incremented to four, four less than equal with four is still true. And now the sum is incremented with four, which basically is six plus four is 10. i is incremented to five, five less than four is false, and we exit the for loop. So this is how you basically trace a program manually, line by line. You basically, usually you have, you write down two variables, sum and i, and you start basically summing i to the, uh, the variable sum, and you can basically see at every step was the value of each of them. I didn't want to make an animation. Basically, you can follow up how these numbers were, were added. You always basically look at the last numbers that are available in the two variables. Now, another thing that you can do with for loops are nested loops. So for instance, let's assume that we want to print a matrix and the elements in the matrix are the row number multiplied with the column number and the columns are between one and 10 and so on, so are the rows. So you start with a for loop that iterates over the rows. For every i from one to 10, that's how you usually read such a statement. And for every i, basically now we have for every value of i, i equal what with one, one less than 10 is true. We have an inner for loop. For every j from one to 10, the product is i multiplied with j. So basically the row number multiplied with the column number, one multiplied with one is one, and we print out the value. Then we continue looping internally. So basically it, this for loop, the inner for loop is executed like a statement by itself. So it will iterate 10 times. And of course it will basically print the numbers from one to 10. The moment that we finish the inner loop, we print the next statement, which is a new line. Then we return to the action after each iteration for the outer loop, i is incremented to two, two less than 10 is true. And now we start printing the second row. So for every j from one to 10, the product is i, which was two multiplied with j. So it will basically have two multiply with one, two multiply with two, two multiply with three and so on, up to two multiply with 10, which is 20. Again, it prints a new line, increments i to three, three less than 10 is true. So now we have another loop to actually print the multiples of three. 3, 6, 9, 12, and so on. So this is how you basically print with the outer for loop the rows and for with an inner for loop all the elements in one row. 
Now, a variable declared inside the block, if you remember about local variables, is known only inside that block. It's basically local to that block. It's called a local variable. And the moment that the block is finished executing, that variable disappears. So why this in, it's important? It's important because any variable that you have defined inside a loop, like a for loop, it's gone the moment that you finish the loop. And that includes the init field for for loops. So if you have an integer i equal with zero, this integer i is available for the duration of running this for loop, but it will not be available after the for loop terminates. So that basically it's an extension of the case of local variables that we talked about in the past. Otherwise, all of the variables that are declared are going to be garbage collected at the end of the loop. Do not declare new variables inside loops. So one thing that I've always, uh, always done, if you want to compute something inside the loop, you should declare the variable outside the loop. This way, you avoid creating and destroying the variables every time you re-execute the loop, okay? So one thing about this code, it's wrong. The fact that I'm declaring the integer product every time I'm executing the inner loop. A better way to write this program, and I will correct now, now on the spot, is to define the integer product outside the loop. So this way is defined outside both loops. So basically what's going to happen is the fact that I'm not going to declare the variable and garbage collected at the end of each inner loop. So it's actually defined outside the outer loop, in fact. So it's only defined once, and all these assignments are assigning values that are used immediately after. Okay. It still matters. So yes, Greg, you are completely right. Product is a variable on the stack. So it's basically in the current uh, execution uh, activation record. But you are still allocating a location of memory of four bytes every time you are executing, re-executing. So I haven't tested uh, myself. Basically, one thing that you can do is to measure the wall time, execute these double loops for large numbers, let's say a million, and then actually you can see if uh, the time changes uh, by defining this variable outside the loop only once or defining it inside the loop. I know for a fact that if they are reference variables, you are actually creating objects in the heap and destroying objects in the heap all the time. So it still matters, but I don't think that it matters as much as it would matter for reference variables. One experiment that I can do after the class is to actually measure the milliseconds for executing some 10 to the ninth executions. And then I can see how much did it consume. It's usually just time. I mean, it doesn't consume more memory at all. OK, now I, talked, I told you about flags. So sometimes you can actually implement a while loop. And within the while loop, if you want to exit the while loop immediately, you can use a break statement. Another statement that we will learn next is continue. Break is like in the case of switch case statements. The moment that break is uh, encountered, the block of that loop, which basically started here and ends here, is exited. So let's assume that we want to count from one to uh, from zero to 20. And we want to basically find when the sum is greater than 100. We don't know after how many steps the sum is greater than 100. So what we can do is to put an if statement, if the sum is greater than 100, break, break the while statement, the while statement that started here and ends here. So the break statement exits the loop immediately and terminates the loop and continues with the rest of the statements after that loop. Okay. Similar to the break statement is the continue statement. By the way, in the previous example, the number for which the sum is 105 is 14. 
So in our in, inside this, basically what we are doing in this function, main method function, we define the sum is equal with zero, the number is equal with zero. While the number is less than 20, the number is incremented with one. So from zero is one, the sum is incremented with the number. So now the sum is one. And while the, uh, if the sum is greater than 100, we break. Okay. So let's actually, one, one thing is to actually see how this executes. So I'm going to change my main method to this one, put a breakpoint, and start executing it with the debugger. So look at the sum as we evolve through the program. So the sum is zero, always look at the value of sum. So we are going to look here for the value sum. So initially the sum is zero, number is zero, zero less than 20 is true, number is incremented to one, the sum is incremented to, from zero to one. If the sum is greater than zero is false, so we read a revert back. One less than 20 is true, Number is incremented to two, sum is incremented with two, so it's now three. Three greater than 100 is false. Number is now incremented to three, uh, to two, so it's incremented to three. The sum is incremented to, five, to six, uh, while the sum, is, the sum is greater than 100 is false. And we continue this and we add the numbers to basically uh, the variable sum. So. We are now at 28, then 36, 45, 55, 66, 78, 91, 105. And now we are basically, the sum is greater than 100. We break, break brings us out of the while statement. And we print out the value of the number, which is 14, and the value of the sum, which is 105. So now the continuous statement. So the continuous statement is like the break statement. It jumps at the end of the current iteration and the program checks the conditions and goes again in the loop. So it's really like a way to skip the rest of the code. So let's assume that I want a program similar to the one before. I basically want to in, in, uh, uh, sum all the numbers less than 20 with the exception of 10 and 11. So I will skip over 10 and 11. And how do I do that? Basically, I increment the number. If the number is 10 or 11, I jump to the end of the loop and I basically continue with the conditional statement. So the continue is basically a jump over the rest of the block of the loop body. That's what it is. It doesn't negate the fact that the condition still needs to be executed. So in this case, basically we will count up to 20, but the numbers 10 and 11 are not included in the sum. So let me actually show you this example. It's very similar to the one before. So again, I will, I will put a breakpoint in this line. So let's execute it with the debugger. And if you look, basically, since the number is not 10 or 11, it adds them to the sum. So very similar to what the code was before. Let's see what happens when we reach 10. So we are now at 9. Now it's 10. The number is 10. Continue. And instead of continuing, the sum is incremented with number it jump back to the while statement. So basically, and the same will happen to 11. So now the number is 11. Instead of continuing with summing the number to the sum, it jumps to the while statement back. So that's basically what the continue does. It skips the rest of the code. It doesn't sum the numbers into the sum. Okay. Let me just execute the entire code. So that's what continue does. It basically skips the rest of the loop and goes back to the loop continuation condition. So that's all about loops. So 
one thing that we can do before we uh, go to methods is to write a simple program that uses loops. So I like a lot printing problems. So let's say that I want to print a matrix. And in this matrix, I want row number to the power two plus column number to the power two. And this is for any integer n. So the user enters n and will print the matrix of n by n with all of this. So for that, we will need a scanner input a new scanner for the system input. Now we'll need, let's print the user system. Enter the size of the matrix. Integer n is input dot next integer. And now we need the for loops. So for every integer i, starting with, let's say one, i is less than equal with n, i is incremented with one at every step. I will need a block and I will show you why, because at the end of each row, I have to print the print statement. So I have two statements in here. I have a for loop that inter increments from j equal with one. j again is less than equal with n. j is incremented with one at every step. We can use no blocks here. So let's print the value that we are looking for. So I'm going to print We need to first compute the value. So I multiply with I plus J multiply with J plus a space after each statement. And then we need a new line at the end of the row. So this actually prints the entire matrix. So let's say that I want a four by four matrix. And you see it's two, five, one plus one, one plus four. So one square plus two square, one square plus three square is one plus nine, one square plus four square, one plus 16 is 17. And then basically four plus one, four plus four, and so on. It's exactly what I wanted, a matrix where every element is the row square plus the column square. Now, let's say that you want not a matrix, but a diagonal uh, tree. So in that case, let's say that instead of iterating up to the value of n, we iterate up to i plus one. So if the size of the matrix is four, we can see it's almost like a tree. If I want to modify it a little, a little bit up to i included, it actually prints only the diagonal of that matrix. So these kind of problems that basically will iterate over the elements and changes them. Okay. Good. So let's talk about methods. So similar to the problems that we started with before, find the multiple sums of integers from one to 10, from 20 to 30, from 35 to 45 and so on. So one way is to basically write similar code for solving these three different problems, but very similar problems. So in one problem, we initialize the sum with zero. We have a loop that iterates from i equal one to 10 and increments i after each iteration. And within the loop, we increment the sum with the value of i. So this computes the sum of the numbers from one to 10, in including both limits, and we print out the result. Similar, basically we can 
iterate again, initialize the sum to zero like before, iterate from i equal 20 to 30, increment i after each iteration, increment sum in the block of the for loop and with the value of i, and then we print out the sum of the numbers from 20 to 30 is this sum. Similar solution if we want to compute the sum between 35 and 45. So again, we'll write a loop that computes the sum of those numbers. But one problem here is that we are repeating code. So if we made a mistake in one of them, like we didn't increment, but we just assigned i, we make it three times. So we'll have to actually uh, solve the problem three times instead of solving it once and just using uh, uh, parameters to parameterize it. So the solution is use a method, basically a method would allow you to write the code once and then using parameters to specify the limits, I1 and I2. So this is a public static sum method that returns an integer for the sum. It takes two parameters. These are called uh, parameters or formal parameters, integer I1 and integer I2. It defines a local variable, sum is equal with zero. And in a loop for every integer i, starting with i equal with i1, as long as i is less than equal with i2, i is incremented with one after each iteration. The sum is incremented with i as the body of that loop. The moment that we finish the looping, looping over the values from i1 to i2, we return the sum. Now, this can be used in all of those three instances. So now we can print out the sum between one and uh, 10 is we, we call the method sum with i1 equal with one and i2 equal with 10. So these are called actual parameters or arguments. We pass one to the first argument of the method, the first parameter of the method, and 10 to the second parameter of the method. And that will execute and return the sum of those numbers between one and 10. Similarly, we can invoke from 20, for 20 and 30. So basically we can invoke that method as many times as we need it. So why do we write methods? We write shorter code. It avoids uh, writing identical code twice or even more. To modularize the, your program, fully testing that method, now we can trust it. We know that we don't need to modify it in multiple places if the code is identical. To make our problems more readable, because now we can basically have one method that prints the sum and the main method doesn't have three loops and uh, 20 statements, it has three statements in which we invoke that method three times. Reusable, now you can use your methods in other programs, you can reuse them in every place you want in every other method. You can test those methods individually and you can basically declare that they are correct. You can debug only once the code in those methods. Uh, easier to extend. You can now write methods that are using the previous methods. One thing is never write methods longer than let's say 100 lines of code. More than 100 lines of code or even 50, it's called spaghetti code. That is long, long methods and steps and it's too difficult and complex to understand. So in order to make your methods more extensible, try to modularize them into simpler parts that can be individually tested. And in some cases, you make your methods more adaptable. So the same method can be actually split into multiple parts, implemented as separate methods, and reused, reused into a different context, adapting it to a different problem. So for instance, let's say that you want to implement uh, searching in arrays. You can actually implement this by sorting the array. If you do it a lot of times, it's much more worth that you sort the array and then you use binary search to actually look faster in the array if you have an element in logarithmic time in the size of the array instead of doing it in uh, the size of the array all the time with linear search. The rule of thumb for implementing methods is that anytime you need to perform one operation in more than one place, make a method for it because you already are using it in two places. 
if you made a mistake, you don't want to correct it twice. You will only correct it once. So today we'll learn how to define methods, how to invoke methods. So first of all, defining methods. A method is a collection of statements, uh, basically a sequence of statements that are grouped together under a name. It has two parts, the method header, which has the modifiers and the method signature and the body of that method. Uh, in Java is required that you have the block for the body of the method. So you must have open curly brace and close curly brace. Now it doesn't have, now we can't rely on the fact that we have only one statement inside the body. Then you can invoke it in any place you want. And we'll start with learning the different parts of a method. So the first part of a method is called the method signature. Is the name of the method followed by uh, the parameters, formal parameters. Each parameter is preceded by the type. These are like method uh, uh, variable declarations. You have integer numbers, integer number, or string number, and so on. So you basically have a, a set of declarations separated with commas of variables. These are local variables called formal parameters that will be initialized the moment that you invoke that method and can be only used inside that method. So basically the formal parameters are the list of parameters that are defined at the beginning of the method in the method signature. The formal parameters are known are variables, basically local variables defined in the method header. When you invoke a method, you invoke it with actual values or what are called actual parameters or arguments. So for instance, our sum method or this max method is invoked with two actual parameters, variables that were defined and instantiated at level at the level of this method, the invoking method, the parent method. Next, you have a return type. So to the left of the name of the method, in this case is max, you have what does this max returns? Returns an integer. For this value to be returned, you must have a return statement within your method. And in fact, the requirement is that in all possible execution paths in your method, you must encounter a return statement. After that return statement is executed, we finish the method, no matter what other statements are after return. The return value must be of the type that is the return value type. So for instance, result is an integer, the method return value is an integer. By the way, if your method doesn't return anything like the main method, then you have to specify void, that the return type is void. Void means that the method doesn't return any value. That doesn't mean that there is no return statement. You, for a void method, the return statement doesn't have a value. It's just return semicolon. So, and it's optional. So you don't need to actually return. Sometimes people like to write return statements to actually return from the method. So now what happens when you call a method? So first of all, I haven't talked about the modifiers. Public static are the modifiers that are we using before the midterm one. So this, the meaning of those two modifiers are that this is a method that can be used from anywhere in Java, public. And static means that is a method that is associated to the class itself. So it can be invoked from the main method without a specific object. So just remember that every method before midterm one start with public static. So for instance, we have a main method in which we instantiate i is equal with five, j is equal with two, k is equal with maximum between i and j. So what happens? Basically, maximum of i and j will invoke the method maximum. So we pass the value of i, which was five, to number one, and j to number two, the two variables that are the formal parameters of max. So now we define an internal variable result. We compare number one, which was five, 
with number two, which was two, five greater than two is true. The result is assigned five. We return the result and we return and we assign the value of max because that was a method that returned an integer to the variable k. And we execute with the print statement, the maximum between five and uh, two is five. So really the idea is that you execute a method, you encounter a method invocation, you leave everything as is, and you go and execute that method in location. Okay. So the benefits of writing a method is that you write it once, and then you can reuse it everywhere you need it. This max now can be used anywhere you want. It also hides information. It hides the implementation from the user. You, if you know the way to invoke this method, which is called the application programming interface API, you can invoke it from wherever you want without having to know what is done internally. It reduces the complexity of the whole program. Now you are only looking at your part of the program. Everything else is the responsibility of who wrote the method. So the API of applica or application programming interface is the method body is the idea is that the method body is a black box that contains the detailed implementation of the method, but we are not interested in it. We are only interested in the method header. What type of inputs this method uh, takes and what is the optional return value, okay? So that is the API, all that we, are, we care about when we inv invoke a method, okay? So let me actually spell it out. This is the application programming interface. You may have heard of this API. And really what it is, is a list of all the public methods defined for that class, for that program. So for instance, let's say that I want to find all the methods that are available for strings. So I will search for string API. That usually takes me to basically where all of the methods are defined. And you can actually see, these are all the constructors. And these are all the methods, character, at, code, point, at, and so on. You don't need to know how is it internally implemented. You only need to know the signature of the method, that this method takes an integer, returns a character, nothing else. This is the API, is the list of all of the method signatures available in uh, a method, in a, in a class. So the API is the list of all the public methods and their description. You can generate it. And I showed you this in the first uh, class. You can take a look at the video, the Java doc for your project. There's the list, the API for your entire project. You can do it in Eclipse from project menu, generate Java doc. It will generate an HTML with all the classes that you wrote. And you can actually look at each one of the classes at the APIs. And here is an example. Now, the first thing that you should know about methods, a return statement is required for a value returning method on all possible execution paths. So let's take a look at this example. We have a sign method that takes an integer n. And if n is equal, it's greater than zero, then it uh, returns one. Else, if n is equal with zero, it returns zero. Else, if n is less than zero, it returns minus one. This method has a syntax error. And the syntax error is that in the view of the compiler, which doesn't execute anything, it just looks at the syntax of the program. We have an if statement, an else branch, an if statement, an else branch, an if statement. And theoretically, if this condition, this condition, and this one were false, we don't have a return statement. So basically what's happening is that Java compiler doesn't execute ex uh, conditions. So it doesn't know the fact that a number is exclusively either positive, zero, or negative. There is no other option for a number to be. But Java doesn't look at the conditions. Java only sees that a Boolean condition is tested here, here, and here. And if these Boolean conditions are all false, I don't have a return statement. 
One easy way to fix this is as programmers to identify the case that if the number is not greater than or equal with zero, the only other option is less than zero. So we can actually remove this if statement and not have the if statement, just else return minus one. So the compiler sees a return statement on all possible paths, either the conditions are true or false. So that's a caution that you will have a syntax error if you don't have a return statement for a value returning method for some execution path. Methods are executed using stacks. So remember our original program, this program that was basically uh, a main method that defined i and j, and then it defined k and invoked the maximum method. This is executed on a stack. So initially, we start the main method. We have one execution record, activation record, in which we define i and j and assign 5 and 2 to them. And this is the actual order in which these values are assigned to the variables, and the variables are allocated in memory. So now we basically pass the values of i and j to a new activation record that is in the method max, which are five for number one and two to number two. Let me actually show you step by step. So we start the main method, i is assigned five, uh, j is assigned two. You see that in the stack, they are put on top of each other, i below and j above. k is declared and we invoke the method max. So the moment that the method max starts, we create a new activation record. At any time, our referencing environment, the variables that can be used, are those that are in the current activation record. So number one will get a copy of i, and number two will get a copy of j. Java uses send by copy or send by value, which basically copies the values of the actual parameters into the uh, formal parameters. So now we start executing the code within the max method. We define the result variable. We compare five with two. The result is assigned five and we return the result. Returning the result means delete the activation record, copy the result five into the value of K because we assigned the max value to K and delete the current activation record and return back to the main method, uh, main method uh, stack. So a stack means that you put on top and the moment that you finish a method, you take and you basically return back to the previous caller method. As I said, Java executes with a method invocation called call by value, meaning that the formal parameters are copies of the original data. The consequences is that if internally in the method you assign something to the variable, the new uh, this variable is can be used in that method, but the moment that you return to the main method, you still have the old values. Okay, so let me show you a very simple example. So let's say that we have a static method main. We defined integer i is equal with one. We invoke the method m with i. And we print out the value of i. The method m is very simple, public, static. Let's say void m takes integer x. Inside here, x is incremented with one. So what happens is that m of i will invoke and will copy the value of i into x. So x is now one. x is incremented with one. We finish the method m, we return here. i is still one because we copied the value of i into x. x was incremented. We return back. i is still one. Basically, we just modify the copy. We didn't modify the original variable, okay? So executing this will print one because i is still one. Either 
And that doesn't matter how many times we increment X, we can increment it a hundred times. Basically, I is still one because we are modifying the value of X only within the method M. We are not actually returning it back to uh, the main method. Okay. So the idea is that you can't assign new values to formal arguments because they don't uh, uh, modify the original pass variables. And the reason why is because we are only changing the copy, not the original variable. So let me show you an example. We have a main method in which we define num1 is equal with one and num2 equal with two. We have a swap method that is invoked with num1 and num2. The swap method takes n1 and n2 as formal parameters. We define a variable temp to which we assign n1. n1 is assigned n2 and n2 is assigned temp. So normally what this code here does, it swaps the two values because it basically uses a temporary variable, puts the, the value of n1 in temp, n1 can now be used to copy into it n2, and uh, n2 is assigned and the temp, which was original n1. But this swapping doesn't work. Why? Look at this stack here. Num1 was one, num2 was two. We pass the values of to n1 and n2, one and two. Inside that method, we swap them. n1 was one and n2 and, and was one and n1 was two. But when we return back to the main method, they are still one and two. They are still the original values. And that is because call by value only copies the values of the actual parameters into the formal parameters. Okay. Overloading, the same method name, but with a different type or number of parameters. So remember uh, the, the plus uh, operator. So the plus operator worked in different ways. And I can actually show you again an example. And let me copy this statement three times. So if we have one plus two, or we have 1.0 plus two, or we have the character one, plus the character two. So the plus operator looks at the arguments that it gets and executes the plus in that type. So one plus two are integers, the value is three. 1.0 plus two, 1.0 is the double. So two is also raised to a double and the result is a double, 3.0. One as a character concatenated with, uh, uh, actually, okay. Uh, as a character, we take the unicodes of the two characters, so it's still sum. But let's transform this one, at least one of them into a string. And now it actually does concatenation. The, the string one concatenated with the character two is basically the string one, two. Okay. So what exactly we did? We did something called overloading or Java did. The same method name, but with different type or number of parameters. So we implemented the, uh, the plus method with integers as inputs, in which case the result is an integer. If at least one of the, result, the inputs is a double, then the other one will be casted to a double. So the result of the sum is a double. If the inputs or at least one of the inputs is a string, then the plus works as concatenation and returns a string. So these are basically the same invocation plus the same name of the method, but based on the arguments, you know which one of these methods will be invoked. The best one that matches the type of parameters. So if you invoke it with two integers, it will call the red plus, which takes integers. If you invoke it with at least a double, it will only work with the second one, the one that takes doubles as the input. And if you invoke it with strings, it will do concatenation of strings. So this is called overloading. Also, if you have different number of parameters. So for instance, I have a plus that works with three parameters. I have a plus that works with two parameters. 
The one with three parameters will be invoked when the invocation has three parameters. The one with two parameters when the invocation has two parameters. So the correct method that is invoked is based on the number of parameters and the type of these parameters. And it's called method matching. Try to, trying to find, this is done internally by Java, tries to find the best method that matches the call. So if I wouldn't have had a method that takes integers, when called with two integers, it would have used the method for doubles because those can be casted automatically to doubles. But if I do have, then the program will have different uh, execution for doubles versus integers. Now, this can actually lead sometimes with ambiguity. So consider the following case. We have a max method that takes an int and a double, and another max method that takes a double and an integer. What if we invoke it with two integers? The question is, which one of these methods matches better? neither one of them. So if one of the methods was missing, then no problem, it would have printed the maximum between the two numbers. But because one of the methods, uh, both methods match equally well the invocation for max between one and two, I get a compiler error. Basically, since there are two or more possible matches equally good, then there is no way to distinguish which one is better. So this is an ambiguous invocation error. It's a compilation error. And basically the way to correct it is either to invoke precisely the method that you want. So for instance, maximum, let's say between one and 2.0 will take the first declaration because that's the one that matches better. Uh, Caleb is asking, would integer double beat double double? Uh, yes. If you invoke it with int double, it will match better int double. So it's, it's more or less similar to the previous case, basically that uh, this one, int int bad beats double double, depending if you call it with two integers, uh, that matches better than if you call it with two doubles. So in this case, in your case, int double beats double double when you call it with an int and a double. Okay. Now, variables that are defined within the uh, within a, a, a method are local variables to that method. The scope is the part of the program in which those variables are defined. So basically they are available between the variable declaration, which could be the formal parameters in that method, up to the end of the block of that in the block in which they were defined. So basically in Java, all local variables start from their declaration up to the end of the block that contains that variable. So for instance, let's look at this example, integer x is equal with one. Another thing is that a nested block cannot redefine a local variable. So you can't redefine x internally here. That's basically a, a, a problem. Uh, you need to use either a different variable or not redefine it. It's considered to be basically bad programming to use in the same method, two variables referring to with the same name, referring to two different things. Usually when we write methods, we try to solve an algorithm. And the software engineering concept for solving algorithms is called stepwise uh, refinement. And can be done basically by dividing the problem into sub-problems and then implementing the subproblems and trying to implement them step by step, divide and conquer. It's also called stepwise refinement. Every subproblem is basically broken into parts and solved internally. Like for instance, let's say that I want to print a calendar for the current month uh, or a month entered by the re reader, by the uh, user. I read the input, I print the month, then printing the month means printing the month title and printing the month body. Printing the month title prints the month name. 
printing the month body prints the start date, the number of days in the month, and checking if it's a leap year. And there are two approaches to solve it. There is one way called top-down approach, in which you start from the top uh, problem and you start implementing it as sub-problems. The sub-problems are basically initially simple, incomplete versions of the methods. They are called stubs. Like for instance, this case, get the start date, return one, just some dummy value. Use the stub enables you to test invoking the method from the caller and then implementing the method yourself. So the top-down approach says implement the main method first and then start implementing the sub-methods. The bottom-up approach means implement the methods from the bottom to the top. So the simpler methods first, and if when you finish them, use them in implementing the next method above it. Usually both approaches are fine, but the, the software engineering tells us that we should actually interleave them. Try to develop a top-down set of stubs and then start implementing from the bottom up the methods. So usually top-down is interleaved with bottom up. Most of the time they are used together. The benefits of stepwise re uh, refinement is that it's a simpler program. You are reusing methods, easier to develop, debug, and test, and it works when you work in a team. We finished about three minutes early. So do you have any questions?